My name is John White, I'm an ex-jockey. Um, I rode in England for a few years. From, I'm local in Banno, um, uh, the farmhouse Banno. My parents had horses in training with Mr. Berry, Padge Berry, for a good few years. I did some showing classes and um, did a bit of hunting with Mick Berry and Matt Roach and when I was young. Michael Hickey, Dennis's father, gave me riding lessons for six weeks, riding show ponies. I had a good show pony. I didn't go to Dublin, but not far from it. Um, she was a three-quarter bred. She was nearly a third pony. She was the business. And um, I learned a lot from her because there wasn't much difference in riding a pony, getting onto a racehorse, because she was really a small racehorse herself. Whereas a lot of problems are you have ponies that are half bred ponies, they're big and slow or whatever, they're grand. But I'd say there's a huge difference when you ride a racehorse. I never had the, that experience of the difference, because she taught me a lot, you know. You had to dress well and you had to look the part and you had to have manners. And Michael Hickey was one, I done many show classes in, in Dublin, like, and he knew what he was talking about. So it was good, he had good advice, and he made you do it proper. And that, you had to learn from that, you know, and you don't. If you're if you, if you want to do something and learn, you'll, you'll do it. And he gave me good advice. And, but funny enough, but after the four or five weeks I was there, he said that was enough. You know, I just think, don't forget all that, and that was it, John. And he was there, the first horse I rode in, in the bumper in Gorn Park. He was there with my mother and father and Paddy Berry. I went to the local school. I was, started riding when I was eight or ten years of age. I had lessons, as I said, from Michael Hickey. I uh, went to school. I went to school in Water Park in Waterford. And um, I just started riding out weekends for Padge. And I kind of went from there. So I decided I'd like to be an amateur jockey. And um, I went down every Saturday. And my father and mother, my mother, ran my mother's name, but my parents had horses down there. So I was going to get a ride on some of those at some stage. And um, Padge was very good to me. My father always had five or six brood mares, and um, basically the ones we couldn't sell, I think, went down to be trained by Padge. And um, I think there were about 27 or 28 horses went down to Padge, and 26 of them won. Um, point to point, and I didn't ride in many point to points because I was going to school at the time, and I rode a few for Padge, and I rode for Christy Canaan, and maybe Neville Tector or someone like that. Padge always said, he didn't want me riding point to points because you don't know what you're getting up on, he said. And just leave it like that. And so we rode a few winners for Padge and Christy. And Christy Canaan was very good to us, great friend, great friend of the family. I think the first point to point, point, to point winner I had was a deep run filly, um, a quite a good filly in Nace, I think she won. And then she won the winners of one in Linkstown. And Paul Barber ended up buying her. And she won a good few races, low, like second grade races in England. Uh, her name was Key, Key Biscayne. Not a big filly, 15-3, by deep run, quick. Four, she won as a four-year-old. I think maybe the only four-year-old Padge ever trained. They always give him a bit more time. And point point is a bit different now than it was back then. My father and John Magner had half shares in a few brood mares. And... Um, my, I call the boss at home always used Grange Stallions with John and he wanted to buy another Mary and, and he ended up buying Banneramber's mother from John Magner. Her name was Darkin, D-A-R-K-A-N and she was in fold to Reekin Rambler who I'd imagine would have been a very successful sire. He stood for two years and he died but he was a very good sire, he got good looking horses and Banneramber was a very good looking horse, big chestnut horse, 16-3. And um, gentleman, a child could ride him. And he went to this. He didn't go to the sales. At one stage, Edward O'Grady tried, came down to see him, and he tried to buy him for one of his biggest owners at the time. I, the name escapes me now. But I remember I was sitting in the sitting room at home. Padge McRae was the, the owner. Was um, was Edward's owner, and the horse wasn't sold over a hundred pounds. <laughs> so then my father and mother decided to put him in training. He wasn't named for a while. He went down to Padge's and um, after a while I remember them um, Padgering and my father. 
and said he was going to come up and have a chat. They were great friends. My father fed all the horses with him every Sunday evening. And I remember the conversation. He said, John, do you want this horse trained for a gamble or do you want to keep him going? Um, and my father said to Padge, what do you think? I don't think, he should, I don't think he should be trained for a gamble, he said. This is a good horse. So it went from there. He had his first run in Nace. No, I'm wrong there. His first race in Leopardstown, and Mick Ennis rode him in a maiden hurdle. And he only beat about three or four home. And um, Mick said the horse has got to be tired. And he ran maybe three or four weeks later, and Mick rode him again. And he said, this is a completely different horse. But, um, so it went from there. He was trained, he won two bumpers in after that. And um, he was a hell of a good horse. Wouldn't show that much at home over a shorter trips working. I rode him work a few times. But it was, after going a mile, ground didn't make any difference to him. He, he could win on good ground. He would, they wouldn't run him on good to firm, but he would win on any ground. Bottomless ground he go through it. But after going about a mile or a mile and two, he'd just come alive under you. But put his head down and just try hard. A very, very good horse. He was beaten. He won three, two or three bumpers. He won at Cheltenham. He came back and he won at Novice Hurl in Pontchastown. He won at Tiestas. He was favoured for the Gold Cup. He got brought down by Lanzarote, which was unlucky. He'd have won that, in my opinion, because I've looked at it. He had beaten the winner, Davy Ladd was the winner, and he had beaten him one day, I'm not sure where it was, but he'd beaten him, given him 18 pounds, we beat him 10 lengths. He ran tight cottage to a short head one day in the Benson and Hedges hurdle, giving him 38 pounds. He wasn't too bad, like. But when he won the Supreme Novices back then, he was two or three seconds faster than Champion Hurdle. Fred Winter came down and spoke to my mother and father and the owners and trainers and said, John, you've made one mistake. He'd have won the Champion Hurdle. His three-parts brother was a very, very good horse. He won three bumpers. A horse called What Am I Bid by Deep Run. Um, he won three bumpers and John Fowler rode him. John Fowler said he was the best bumper horse he ever saw him. He was, fit, he was winter favour for the Sun Alliance before he ever jumped the hurdle. He ran in, in I think, the TS, it might have been the TS that's made over hurdles, and he won a neck. We were disappointed with him. He ended up, he was bleeding, we couldn't stop him bleeding. But he won, I think he won three bumpers, something like 32 lengths or something like that. He, was never, he wasn't for sale. Never? No. No, it said I wouldn't sell him. We'd sell other horses, but he was never for, never for sale, you know. At that stage, um, Time Farm rated him when he was favoured for the Gold Cup, the highest rated horse in England or Ireland. He won the Tiestas, he beat Fort Fox. And Bunny Cox rang Padge and asked him how the horse was. The ground that day in, in Gorn was very, very soft. And they battled all the way to the line, the two of them, you know. And Padge said, he's great, we let him out in the field this morning, he's bucking and kicking. How was your fella? He hasn't got up out of straw yet, he said. I think Tommy McGivern rode Ford Fox. Great jockey too, Tommy. My parents had a horse when trained with Padgett, an Arctic slave horse. We taught a bit about him. And um, they sent down another horse to him by Arctic slave. And um, he, he wanted decent ground. I didn't know much about it at the time. I still don't know much about things. But he wanted decent ground. So Padgett decided he was going to run him in the, in the winter. And that's the first effort I had going to a race course or being in a away room or was to ride this horse. Um, his name, he ran away in the water with me, got loose in the water with me one day, he ran away with Mrs. He. So my mother called him Up the Creek. So Up the Creek was my first venture on the race course. Um, I think the first race I rode was in Gorn on very soft ground. And the instructions were, I thought this is going to be easy, that I'm going to jump out in the first two or three and win. So the instructions were from Padge was, jump off last or second last, and pass a few. And I said, what? Jump off last, second last, and pass a few. And I said, you not think I should be a bit closer? If you're any closer, you won't learn it. And when you're back there, he says, look up and learn what's going on in front of you. It's very, very good advice. So I had a couple of spins on him. 
on ground that he didn't like and he was put away then for a couple of months and the other horse was ready and he went to um, Limerick Junction, a horse called Mujer Eslav. He won eight lengths first time out, backed off the board. He was the first winner, I'm not sure what the second winner was, but uh, I was riding for Padgeberry, Mr. Kinnan, Christy Kinnan, a great friend of ours, and I rode, horse, I rode winners for Gillian O'Brien, Fancy's daughter. Um, I'm not sure who else I rode for, but I rode out my claim, I rode plenty of bumper winners. And, um, whatever Padge said, if he fancied one, they wouldn't be too far away. You know? I'll tell you a funny story about Padge. We had another horse running in the point to point. And back then, I'm not sure where the, ent the entries weren't out. Maybe on the Saturday, I'm not sure, but I don't think the entries were out. You could double enter him. And this fellow was, he had been galloping well, and there was a bit, a bit of talk about him. So the Saturday evening before the point to point, I was sent down to John Sinners. I have one bottle of beer. And anyone asked me where we were going tomorrow, tell them we were going to Dungarvan. The horse was called Even Nook. So a lot of people have kind of fell out with me over the years because Padge and myself wouldn't be that straight, or Padge wouldn't be that straight, and I had to do what I was told. So the information went back to a man called Bobby Dowden, Wexford was one. Um, what's the man that had the hardware? Um, Dermot Trainer, Michael Codd, and someone else. So. The horse was loaded up the next morning and Michael Cullen was working for Padge that time and my father and Padge said, you go into that box, horse box with Michael, keep him company. So instead of going to Dungarvan, we went to Tipperary. And the first race, the horse hosed up. He won not easy, he was a good horse, a horse called Even Nook. And um, as we were driving out of the point to point track in Tipperary, this car come flying up and was flashing lights. So we stopped and the, pulled up beside us, let the window down and asked Michael, it was the first race over? Yes, he said, the second is on now. He said, who won the first race? John did. And he said, who? John White. <laughs> the boys weren't too pleased. They'd driven to Dungarvan, missed out there, hadn't missed the one back in the other place. I had been in England when I was 13 or 14 years of age and for a week here and there, actually riding out for Jenny Pippin when she was in Hinton Parva. Um, Jenny's first husband was very friendly with my parents, Richard Pittman. So Richard took me under his wing a couple of times and I went over there. So I knew a bit about England before I went. A small bit only. Um, why did I go to England? Myself and Padge had a bit of a fallout. And I was still an amateur here, I'd ridden my claim out. And I thought the best thing to do was maybe to go to England. I thought if I stayed around here, I might have caused a bit of friction. I didn't want to do that. So I decided I'd ring Richard and go to England as an amateur. So I rang Richard and he said that Nicky Henderson was looking for an assistant trainer and an amateur. And I said, that'd do me fine. So that's how I ended up going to England. He was down in Windsor House then. Um, I suppose he's we have eighty or I'm not sure eighty or hundred horses maybe. If that, I'm not I'm not sure to be honest with you now. But he wouldn't have had any more than eighty. We had good horses. He was down in Windsor House, in the middle of Lambourne, and he trained a lot of winners out there. I was there for a year before I had a ride. He didn't have many bumper horses there to be honest with you. And um, I was happy enough to be there to see things, how things were done over there, you know. And I rode a horse for a guy called Brian Chin, who bought horses off my father and Padge. A very good horse called Mossy Moore. I won a bumper on Mossy Moore in Wexford. He's very good, he won in Cheltenham, he's a very good horse. We saw him to Brian, and Brian was a ship's chandler in Bristol. And he had a couple of fellas working from the train, and all he'd had was about eight or 10 horses in the train. And I got a phone call or the office, Sandra, in the office of Nicky's got a phone call inquiring would I ride a horse from in Bangor in, a, in an amateur chase. So she put the phone down and said to, said to the boss, said to Nicky, this fellow wants 
trying to ride the horse and Nicky looked, said to look the farm up does the horse jump well and things like that and it was, everything was okay so we rang back and said I'd ride the horse little did I know that Brian was a huge gambler little did I know so I went down to Bangor and um, Nicky had said to me go to the right one because there's two bangers, John and the amateur chase was I don't know what the place on the day so I walked it no sorry it wasn't an amateur chase I'm wrong an ordinary handicap chase. And um I can't think of I can't think of his name now. But he was backed off the boards. He won five or six lengths. And the, it was a bit scary because John Joe Neal was trying to catch me on the second horse going to the last. And all I could hear him was screaming and at his fella and bang, bang, bang. And I thought, geez, I hope this fella doesn't get up and beat me. Something Strix was the horse's name. He won. He was a good horse. He won, I'd won a few on him. So then, when he won, Nicky decides to give me a ride. And I rode a horse in a hurdle race for him, and that won. So it kind of went from there, winners are here and there, you know. I rode a winner for John Magner. That's come back a while ago now. For Pat Hogan. Um, a very good horse, too. Ended up breaking his leg. He won the, what's the big hunter's chase in Fairy House? Is it Joseph O'Reilly, is it? He won that, yeah, horse for. John Magner owned him. Horse by Deep Run. Um, Pat, Pat Hogan wanted me to come up, wanted me to, I was riding. I still had an amateur license. And Pat wanted me to come back and ride point to pointers for him. Up the whole lot of them. So I said, look, I've just arrived over here and I can't go back, you know. So then he said, um, look, I'm running the horse in the fairy house. So I said I'd ride him. And he rang me, he spoke to me maybe two months before. And he ran three or four in the race. Roger Hurley rode one, which I don't know Roger, I forget a rode or two. But Pat said this horse will win. Horse John Magnum rode him. It was by a deep run. It was his first run on the track. He'd won a pint of pint somewhere. A horse called You're a Star. And um, Pat said, all you have to do, he says, John, is stay wide. Stay very wide, don't get involved with any other horse, and you'll win. And if you don't win, it's not your fault, but stay wide. So that was quite easy, I just stayed wide and he won. Pat didn't want him to get involved, he wouldn't have had that much experience with, with some of the, the hunter chasers, you know, but he stayed wide and he had an accident afterwards. But he was a good horse, John Magnum owned him, and Pat, Pat Hogan was a great man as well. Pat trained him. I had breakfast every morning with Nicky. Nicky and his first wife, Diana, or Diana was a good friend of mine, they were very good to me. And um, he said, John, uh, I think you might, ha you might have to turn professional because if you ride more than 21 rides against professionals, the boy, uh, I'm not sure whether the licence company didn't like it, they didn't, they didn't want you to ride, and at that stage I was riding a bit more than that. So I, I, was, I didn't really want to turn professional, and then he, he kind of twisted my arm and then I turned professional. I'm not sure what year it was, but we I rode a few winners. I wouldn't, I wouldn't find it any different, there's no point, the pressure, there's no point worrying about it, is there? You know, it's just, you have to get on and do it. But if Cheltenham is a funny track, it's not as easy as you think, it's turns and twists and up and down. You know, some people have the idea that Cheltenham is a great track. It is a great track, but it's not an easy track. If you go down the inside and you get stopped once or twice, that's you finished. You won't get back into it at Cheltenham, because they go that quick if you miss a hurdle or get stopped. You won't get back into it. But I was listening to um, John Franklin the other day, and um, John was very good. John was a great jockey, but he came out with something, on it was, I'm not sure if it was on television or the paper, but he said that Rachel Blackmore rides Cheltenham very, very well. And he's right what he said, because the quicker the race or the better the race, the longer you can wait. That was always my opinion. There's one thing people, sh people do forget, and they shouldn't forget. The better the race, the faster they go, the longer you can wait. And the wind post, it doesn't really change. You know? It's the same place. So you see fellas in championship races kicking on three out. They're up there. The wind post is down here. So how do you think they'd feel now when they're going to the last and they start to go, go empty? Wouldn't be that clever now, would it? I prefer to get. I prefer to get beat up here than down there. Does that make sense? 
the first time I went to Cheltenham, I rode a horse for Nicky Vigers. He was a, I still was an amateur. He was a very, very good horse. A horse called Kesslin. And um, he was a good horse on the flat. And I think he could be wrong, but I think he was a miler on the flat. And maybe listed as a great group threes. So I decided to send him jumping. And Nicky Vigers was a very good friend of Nicky Henderson's. So Nicky said, get John to ride a horse. So we schooled him in Lambourne. He wasn't the easiest, but he was a very good horse. They ran him one day in Toaster, which is a very stiff track. And he ran very keen with me. Didn't jump well and ran keen. And fell in the hole after the last. But I thought he was a smart horse. And they were a bit disappointed. I said, he ran, ran too keen, didn't jump well. But he's a smart horse. I said, you'll have to run him again quick. The owners wanted to go to the Cheltenham with him. So then Nicky ran him maybe 10 days or two weeks later, round Windsor. And he asked me on the day, what are you going to do? Actually, Nicky asked me what I was going to do with him. I told Nicky what had happened. He asked me what I was going to do with him. I said, I'll have to drop him, walk him out last. I walked him out last, he won 15 lengths. He was a very good horse. So then he went to the Sun Lines. And the first, the first ride I had in Cheltenham was on Kesslin. And I thought, driving to Cheltenham, the biggest trouble I'll have is holding this horse. Because he was so quick. And the biggest trouble I have is getting to the start. Well, I got the two of those wrong. He got to the start okay. And then when I got to the start, I thought, no, I hope he settles. We jumped off. I was tapping him down the neck to try and lie up. That's the difference between Cheltenham and anywhere else. He was flat out. He finished second that day. Our called Harry Hastings beat me 15 lengths. Only his third run over hurdles. I went on to win a few races on him. I won the, the champion hurdle in Leperton. I lost it in the stewards room. You should never have lost it. It's the worst decision in Irish racing. He went to America then. Charlie Fennick bought him. And I rode him in the first Breeders' Cup chase. A beaten necker at half a length on him. Missed the second last of them that he'd have won. He was a very good horse. He, he ran in the champion hurdle. I was meant to ride him in the champion hurdle. And Nicky asked me to ride, wanted me to ride first spout. So I had to ride a horse called first spout. And he ran a bit keen. And we should, we were, probably rode him the wrong way. But Hugh Davis rode Kesslin. And Hugh came into the way room, threw his saddle on the bench and said, John, I don't want to ever sit on him again. He's horrible. He couldn't jump. Hugh, didn't, Hugh was a great jockey. But he was, Kesslin was a funny horse, but a very, very good horse. There's a couple of ways of looking at that, at that question. There's a couple of answers for that, you know. The best horse I rode was a horse called Azarovich. I won a good few races on him. He won two or three festivals. He was second in the national. He was fourth in the national. If, if I was in trouble and wasn't having a winner, when he'd pop up, he'd have a winner, he'd, he'd get you going again, you know? He was a very, very good horse. If, if he didn't, he finished second in the national and he didn't really stay, but he was in front of the elbow. But he, he wasn't a real stayer. And if he stayed, he would have been a Gold Cup horse. But he didn't, he'd buy a sprinter, buy mommy's pet. And, um, which was a very quick horse. I think he was a five furlong horse, a good, a good, a good, a good stallion for sprint, off, off sprinters. And um, he won the Mild Mayor Fleet, which is, I'm not sure, two and a half miles, is it? I'm not sure what that was now. He won that, and won it easily each time, to be honest with you. And he'd always imagined that if he won that, he might go on, but he, he, he wouldn't get three miles around Cheltenham. And yet he finished second in a national. But he wouldn't get three miles around Cheltenham. And the day he finished second, I'd say I was maybe lent up at the elbow and Steve Knight passed me by with Mary Venture, who wasn't a good jumper. He jumped that day, but he didn't. He wasn't a good jumper around park fences. And I can remember the next morning, Fred Winter tapped me and said, come up to Uplands for a drink. So I said, I will, Governor, yes. I went up anyway and he says, don't ever, yeah, don't ever be worried about that race yesterday, he said. We give that, that horse every chance to win and move on, he said. Fred was a great man. He wouldn't have made me a flea twice. I think that's the only time he ran there, to be honest with you. I don't think he ever rolled my, uh, even in other, uh, the, the only time I, I, I think he went to Chetland once for the festival, I think, you know. He won the H&T Walker 
Road Ascot. Um, I was an amateur then. I hadn't turned then. But he won that. He was impressive that day. And um, Brown Windsor won the, um, the cat card. Beat Tom Morgan. Tom was riding a horse of um, John Edwards. They beat Tom a short head. Tom always tells me I had two stone in hand, I give him a bad ride. <laughs> Michael Bowlby was rode him originally at, at Nicky's. And um, I might have sat on him a few times at home. And he wouldn't impress you that much at home. And I was riding him a bit of work one day. And he wouldn't impress you that much at all. And I remember the next day Nicky said to me, I win the champ I win the Liverpool bumper with this fella. And I said to myself, he's mad. This is not gonna happen, you know. But he did win the bumper. Michael rolled him, and Michael rolled him all along then. And um, I rolled him one day in Sandown. I'm not sure, in a goodish race. And um, I rolled a bit for Barney Curley as well. Barney was a very, very good man. And as I was walking out of the, from the parade ring to go to the start, another road they walk along there. Barney was there and he says, John, will you win? You see? So I said, Barney, this is not trained by you. It's not, not to do with you, like I said, you know? He said, I know that, he says, John, but do you think you'd win? I said, it's Mr. Henderson's horse, I can't say. But I, I'd like to know, do you think I'd win? And I said, I think I'd win. I think I will, he said, yeah. That's good, he said, because I've just had a lot of money on you. Thankfully, the horse won. He won quite well. That's the first time I rode him. And um, he wasn't the quickest horse, but he won, won the, the cat cart over two miles. He wasn't a big horse, but he jumped, he jumped well, and he didn't, lo he didn't lose much. He didn't, he didn't spend much time in the air. In and out quick, didn't do anything flash. And he'd always stay, he stayed well each time on those two occasions I rode him. Um, he was owned by Michael Buckley, who has Constitution Hill now. He was owned by Michael Buckley and Bill Sham Kidd, two great men. And so he was, after winning the cat cart, he was, the National was the next place for him. And he was favoured for the National. And he ran a blind, to be honest with you, as a, as a nearly a novice, you know. On quick ground, um, Marcus Armitage won the race on horses of Kim Bailey's, Mr. Frisk. And um, I was kind of, I, I saw the race the other day, I thought I was a bit handier. I was flat out all the time, jumping well, and he was doing everything correct. And I thought, I might have, I must have a chance here because Marcus has gone too fast. I said to myself, he, this, this, this thing can't keep going. But it did keep going, Marcus won. <laughs> um, the first horse I rode in the National was a horse called Spartan Missile. For, um, I rode Spartan Missile, Diana Henderson, Nicky's first wife's parents owned him. John Thorne. And he came back in the train and they ran Spartan Missile in uh, the Hunters, the, the Hunters Chase the Festival, what's it called now, the Fox Hunters. So I rode him in the Fox Hunters. I, fin I forgot about it, I finished second. And I ran a blinder, at the end of his years, to be honest with you, the end of his, his best seven days were gone, you know. But he ran a blinder, jumped off handy on the inside, didn't miss a beat, jumped like a book. Did everything right, and um, I thought I had a bit of a chance. If the one in front of me made a mistake or did something silly, I thought I had a bit of a chance. The one in front of me didn't. That was Venture de Cognac and Oliver Sherwood. But he, he was, he had jumped well, but he then went to Liverpool. Uh, big horse. I'd say now the conditions of the race now wouldn't suit him. The fences were bigger then. He jumped well and he, he probably, he wouldn't handle the, the track now, you know, it's modified now, I wouldn't have suited him. But he finished fourth, ran a blinder. But that was the first experience I had around there. I rode 11, 11 I had 11 rides in Liverpool. Um, I think I fell twice, I think. I, just, I think I finished fourth in the Scottish National. I finished second in the Norwegian National. For John Jenkins. I went, then I was first jockey to John Jenkins at some stage. My, I'm not good with years, but John had a horse. I can't think of his name now, to be honest with you, but he was kind of, a, he, he'd get beat around Newbury and places like that. And I'm not sure what he'd put his best foot forward. And 
John decided to run him in, in the Norwegian National. There was, the prize money was good. And at that stage, you couldn't, you couldn't um, use a stick out there. So I thought, I didn't realise that until I went out there. So I thought, this is not going to be great. And as he probably run his best race ever, with no stick on him, beating the neck or something. It's a bit of an experience in the nightclubs out there. <laughs> he finished second to um, Maori Venture. I finished fourth one year on him. I think I finished fifth another year, you know. He was a, he was a hell of a good horse. Um, he was the second horse I rode in it. The other one horse called Classified. Um, I'm not sure, I think he finished fourth. A friend of mine, Paul Crouch, was meant to ride him. And um, Paul didn't ride him. Um, he wasn't a big horse. He finished fourth. Steve Smith Eccles rode him another year. And I rode a horse called um, Ten of Spades for Colonel Whitbread. Nicky Henderson trained him. I think he finished fifth or sixth. Um, I rode um, Brown Windsor, finished fourth. I rode a horse for um, an over river horse for John White. He fell at the last. And I rode a horse for John Edwards, who, who ran across the track with me. A horse called Bob Tisdale. Tom Morgan was riding some Nelson. And as the tapes went up, he cocked his jaw and went straight and he went out to the stand with me. Um, I rode each and S twice. The year that everything went wrong, and he went back there. And um, he wasn't right after that. He wasn't. He had a year off, and he went back there, and he fell. And I said, "That's that's me." Kind of. I thought this was my last ride in the national. Then you know, he fell. He had a year off, and Johnny ran and went Canton, a place like that. They just get him back there, but he wasn't the same horse as he was. He must have had some issues. But when he won, he was a very, very good horse. He, um, he was trained by Mrs. Pittman and he ran in Cheltenham, the festival, the four-mile race. Um, he didn't run well. He was actually favoured for the race. Philip Fenton rode him and then it was decided he was going for the national and Patrick Bancroft rang me and asked, would I ride him? So I said I'd ride the horse, yeah. If the boss didn't have something in it, which he didn't. And I schooled him and jumped him six, schooled him over six fences one day and he seemed to be good, he seemed to be... He was trained by the right trainer anyway, you know, and the horse was in good shape, so that's how it all came about. On the day, everything worked out, only the race was void. The horse didn't know that, but he jumped well and he was a good national winner, in a quick time. There's so many things going on, there's so many, there's animal, animal rights people and there's so much going on around there, you know, I didn't, didn't know. And I wasn't the only one that went around. You know, some people forget that. But I didn't see him because if I, if, if I saw something, I'm not going to continue the race to get a fall off the horse, to injure the horse. It's not my property. The man on the stand up says, pays train fees for the horse. Mrs Pittman trains it. Like, I have to look after their interests as well, you know. And look after the horse. So I'm not just going round there for the fun of it, you know. I, I knew when I went past the post, when Dean Gallar came up to me and said to me, and said, um, this is not going to work out, I don't think this is going to stand, Johnny. So I knew then. No, but it was chaos, to be honest, the whole, even, I don't know, it should have been dealt with better on the day, even. Um, not only by the stewards, but by trainers, by owners, or people looking after owners, everything was a bit of a mess. No one knew what was going on. Um, I went in with the... I went in with a saddle and my valet John Buckingham at the time said, don't, don't pass the scales. You get on the scales. Do not come into this room. And John was out there with me. Um, and no way would the clerk the scales let me weigh in. But John was there and there was no one else with me now, only John, you know, which I thought was wrong. I forget, the, who was, I forget who the clerk of the scales was that day, but there's no way was he going to let me pass. Because John's story was that if I walk into the room there and I hadn't, I hadn't sat down on the scales, if the race was OK, I hadn't weighed in. They should have let us weigh in, yes. 
But there's so many mistakes, I can't think of them all now, to be honest with you. But there's so many mistakes made on the day. But John was pretty quick out there, because John, John was correct in what he's, what he's thinking was, you know? It was a bit... It was a day I wouldn't forget. But look, it's a horse race, and it's only... There's worse things happen in life, isn't there? Slalom was a good horse that rode in England. And um, we sold him as a three-year-old. He went to... Um, Mouse Morris. John Horgan rode him. He won a point to point one day. And it wasn't, they weren't happy he won. John Queeley rode him, and there was a bit of a row, and then... He ended up going to the sales. I think before he went to the sales, he ran in the Arkle in Leopardstown. I think it was the Arkle as a novice in Leopardstown. It was only beaten maybe a couple of lengths, maybe three or four lengths, by a good horse of Arthur Moores. So he ended up going to the sales in Doncaster. And I thought, geez, this horse now, he's won a point to point. Oh, sorry, before he went and ran in the novice chase, he went a bump around Clonmel. And we had sold him for about 30,000 two or three years before that. A lot of money back then, you know. I think I bought him for 13,000. Doncaster. Ken Oliver was the boss in Doncaster that time. So I went up and Ken said to me, um, Ken knew me from being there from a young lad with horses for my parents and horses for Padge. And he said, Have your father hasn't gone on the sales, John, has he? I said, no, he hasn't. And he says, Padge? He said, um, no, he hasn't. What are you doing here? I'm going to buy a horse. Great news, he said. Best news I've heard for a long time, young and buying horses. It's not great, I said, Ken. I said, why is that? He said to me, because I've got no money. I wouldn't let that stop you, he said. Whatever you want to do, go and buy him. So I said, we went to the office now, and he went to the office with Ken, and he said, whatever John buys, that's OK. So we, I bought the horse for 13, I think it was 13,000. He, um, he was paid for within three or four weeks. He won the Reynolds Town, he won the Challow, he was a hell of a good horse. He finished second in the sun in the sun lines. He had a slight heart murmur, and you'd have to arrive at the last with him. He he would have won only for Toby Tobias fell at his third last or second last. I'm not sure, and left me in front. If I had a lead to the last, he'd have won. I'd beat him and neck on him. When we bought him, he ran his first run was round Kempton. And he wouldn't show that much at home. And he ran at Kempton. Friends of mine bought him. The horse's favourite, and actually won the race, was favourite for that year's Southern Lines. A horse John Jenkins trained called Away We Go. I finished sixth or seventh. And Claire was friendly with mine and Russell. But Claire's my wife. And uh, she was racing that day and she said, John, how did the horse run? I said, I'll meet you and the owners and trainers, I said, in 10 minutes or 15 minutes after having a shower. If I'm lucky, I said, because I'm not there in 10 or 15 minutes, I'd be in the steward's room. So she, he ran well, yes, if I'm, if I'm not there in 15 minutes, I said, I'd be in the steward's room. I'm in the shower expecting a knock or a call for John White to go to the steward's room because if I had to sneeze or come up the straight, I thought he would have nearly beaten the way we go, which was favoured for the on the lines. I and Michael, uh, Michael Robinson trained him and Michael said to me, he's very slow, John, is he? Isn't he? I said, he is, Michael. I said, he, I said, he is, yeah. So Derek and Minor Russell live just in Ascot. So we had a drink in the owners and trainers and Minor said, look, I'll come back and we'll have some dinner. I went back to Lightwater with Derek and Minor, who owned the horse, and I said, um, this horse would have nearly won today. This is a very, very good horse. They ran him three weeks later in Wolverhampton. And he won 15 lengths. Never off, never off the bridle. And they had a good bet on him at a huge price. Slalom was a good horse and he ran over fences. He probably wasn't the fluent of jumper, but he got from A to B. If he had a run, he ran the Gold Cup the, day, the year Desert Orchid won. I think he fell at a third last, something like that. But he ran as a novice. If he had waited another year, he'd have been a Gold Cup contender, I'd imagine, you know. Cockenstrand, uh, 
they want a bumper in Kakasan want a bumper in Tarlis. It's a horse by Prince Hansel. Horse sixteen three, fine big horse. He um he probably had a run or two over hurdles before he went for his bumper. He went he, he won a hot bumper in um in Tarlis. He beat a horse called Deep Gale. Deep Gale went on to win for JP in Cheltenham. And um he was for sale, Cockleton was for sale, he was sold in Doncaster and um, Ken Oliver, the director of Doncaster, bought him, he was trained at the time, bought him for one of his friends or best owners, Colonel Greg, to win a Scottish National. I think he duly won two years later, he was a very good horse. Um, he probably had one or two runs over hurdles, I, I rode him over hurdles one day in Leopardstown, I think, and when he went to um, Torlis, he won, and he was sold then. The trainers I rode for, yeah. Nicky Henderson, um, Ferdy Murphy, rode in Fairford, and Ferdy was trained for Jeff Hubbard, and um, I rode for Charlie Brooks when he took over from Fred, Mick Gaisley, I'm not forgetting half of them now, John Upson, I rode a racing post, race winner for John Upson. John was involved with the Costlos, but most of his horses, I'd say, from Costlos. Uh, the horse that won the race in post chase was a horse by over the river, Zeta's lad. He, he was a, if he, I won a, the rehearsal chase on Zeta's lad. He was a good horse. Um, Captain Foster. Captain was a great man. I rode a horse one day in Folks and for the captain. He wasn't much, but he usually had the same owners day in, day out, but he had a new order for a horse, and he bought this horse, and I asked him, who are the owners of these new type of owners, he said, John. I said, what do you mean? I said, I think they're called yuppies, he said, from London. I said, all right. He said, they came in to see the horse, he said, and they've got all these shiny shoes. <laughs> so. The horse wasn't much good. He, he outschooled him, so he was running folks, and then he went, and he asked me to go down and ride the horse, and I went down with the captain. And um, these three boys from London arrived into the into the parade ring, and the first thing the captain said to me, "I want to thank you very much, John, for coming down to ride this horse." And I said, "That's okay, Governor. I know I really want to thank you, said, because I think it's the worst brute I've ever trained." <laughs> well, the the yuppies and the shiny shoes boys. Weren't too pleased. The horse ran fourth or fifth or something like that. He wasn't much good anyway, but he didn't stay there too long. And the captain, maybe a couple of weeks later, and said, "I knew it wasn't going to work out with the yuppies, John." <laughs> um, John Frankham, Peter Scudamore, Graham McCourt, Hugh Davis, Richard Rowe, Ben Dehan, Richard Dunwoody, Declan Murphy, Kevin Mooney. Phil Took, Neil Doughty, who else? I've rolled for a fair, look, a good few. A fair list of jockeys, to be honest with you. Timmy Murphy, Charlie Swan when he came over, Tom Morgan. It's a fair list of jockeys when you think about it. You'd forget things like that, wouldn't you? I lived in Lamborn then. Um, Myself and Kevin Mooney. Kevin was a great rider, rode for Fruit Ballon. Then he went to work as assistant trainer to Barry Hills. Still friends. Um, myself, Kevin, Ben Dehan. I had two young lads in England, and John come race my and Kevin's father would look after him for me. John was seven or eight or from going to the local races with him. Tony, that's Kevin's father, would bring the young lad off. And it's kind of, um, no, he wouldn't. It wasn't great travelling on your own because we got hurt. Got hurt. How are you going to go anywhere? To be honest, you know. So we always one drive one day, another drive another day, or whatever. I always thought John was the best jockey because um, he didn't care. He um, he did what he thought was right himself. Like for instance, I was schooling horses one day for Nicky, and um, John was there. John used to ride for Nicky, and this horse went up over three hurdles or six hurdles or something. And Nicky said, "Are you happy with that?" And I said, "No." I said, he's just missing one all the time. And I just said, 
John was there. I said, just get John to sit up on him. And John would sat up on the horse, jumped up on the horse. He probably can't remember this, but I never forget it. He went up there twice, and he thinks it was poetry in motion. Got off the horse, he said, yeah, he's all right. But he was, John was, was he a European champion show jumper? You know, and, and like his ride and sea pigeon in the champion hurdle that time was, was master class, I thought, you know. Uh, Steve Smith Eccles, myself, um, Christ, I don't know who else was there, but well, John had stopped riding a bit, I think, I'm not sure. But Steve was there, yeah. There was no rivalry at all, to be honest with you. I suppose there should have been, but um, it's different times now, isn't it? You know, back then it's, it was easier. The way of life was easier, where now it's, it's hectic, isn't it? He, 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 was, he was mad, like, you know? Like, he, he had to win and that was it, like, no matter what the cost or... But you saw someone on television the other day about him. He's living in um, Spain. Spain or something like that now, you know? He was some bit was before Cheltenham that he did an interview with Tony McCoy. Richard was a great writer. He wrote for um, David Nicholson, the Jew. Jamie Osborne was a good writer. A lot of good writers around that time. It was the day that the Zarvage won the H&T Walker in Ascot when I was an amateur because they had enough confidence to keep me on the horse and um, the horse won. I had a few nice days but I thought that's, that's, that was the one that sticks out a bit. Newbury would be my favourite track by a long, long way because it's close to home. But Newbury was a great track. Ascot, Kempton, there was great, some great tracks. I didn't like I didn't like Fontland, I didn't like Plumpton. <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> All right. On fast ground to go through fast and you don't have to ride a race, you could be any kamikaze pilot and go mad and, you know, it, was, it didn't take much working out. And things like that didn't suit me, you know. Oh, I don't know, I don't know, I suppose. Um, uh, to me, it doesn't make much difference one or the other. Some people think, your this fellow might be better over fences. Maybe you still ride a long leg, you're better over fences. But a lot is down to the horse, you know. And I remember going years ago riding for Nicky that horses have run over hurdles a few times, or handicappers even. We might only school them two or three times over a fence and they'd run. And, but after their first run, he'd bring them back and then he'd school them even more, maybe. But to, from getting A to B, like if you lift the legs at all and have a small bit of brain, they'll get over it, you know. But they, they might only do that to the handicappers, but when they come back after the first run, he always said school and after the first run was more important. Because they've gone out there the first time and they mightn't have learned that much. So he, he'd give them a fair bit of school for their second run after that, over, you know. I remember riding a horse one day for a Gillian O'Brien, a horse called Five Nations. I think it was, I was not still an amateur over the time, and um, he ran the hurdle race at Gorn. And Fancy said to me, you dropped this fella in last, he said. He's very keen. Vincent had him on the flat. It's by Apalachi. Gorgeous horse. And um, he was keen, but he, he settled. He, he, he fell asleep with me. I left him alone. I didn't move on him. But he finished about fifth. A hell of a good horse. He won two bumpers. A horse called Five Nations. He won two bumpers. And he got beat in a third bumper. And I was beaten going to the start on the ground so soft. And I got beaten neck and the horse that beat me was Mr. Donovan. And it's a pity he hadn't gone jumping. He would have made a real good jumper, you know. A horse called Mossy Moore. It's a funny story. It's a funny story and it isn't a funny story. And Mossy Moore was sold to Brian Chin. He wasn't much to look at, but he was a very good horse. And he didn't acclimatise when he went to England. I rode him once or twice. I rode a few winners for Brian, but I rode this horse once or twice. And he wasn't the same horse over here. And he was bought. I forget what he paid for him. But I could have bought him back off Brian for, for that. And I said to Brian, no, no. I said, don't keep that horse. This horse will come right. He's something not right. He's different. He hasn't acclimatised or whatever. So he kept the horse. So the horse came back in the train the next year. Brian rang and said, you can ride whatever you want. He said, but I don't think you get on with Mossy Moore. And I said, what? I don't think you get on with Mossy Moore. And I said, Brian, hang on. You're wrong. No, he says, I'm not wrong. He says, John. He didn't run well with you, 
That was something else I said. There's something no matter with the horse. So I wasn't too pleased when I saw John Joe win and Mossy Moore at the festival. <laughs> Times haven't changed anyway, you know. Times of races haven't changed. I'd say um, the reason, if Brown Windsor, this is no disrespect to the point to point fellas over here, but if Brown Windsor was, ra was point to point in Ireland as a four year old, I wouldn't have won a cat cart on him or I wouldn't have finished fourth in national on him because he wouldn't have got there. Because as a four year old, he was looked after as a four year old. He'd have been trained over here and that'd be good by Brown Windsor. I think. How long did it last for these horses are gone too quick, you know? As the boss always said when we went racing with him, that you'd have to look after the horse, you know, he said, because the owner has bought his horse. It might be the only horse he can afford. Which is true. They may not have any more money to go buy another horse, it's their property, so he has to be looked after. They're paying the train fees and the sales yards now you have to win first time out. You have to win as a four-year-old. And then you get your money, you're sold. I was talking to a, a, a big trainer in England a couple of months ago, and he was saying the only way you could do that now is if you buy a horse that wins over here, you'd have to give him a year off. Whereas going back to when Page and Christy, Christy Canaan, I rode a lot of winners. Christy was a great, Christy Canaan was a great trainer. Gambling man as well, he had to, to pay his staff and everything. And, um, Paget's horse would be very well schooled, as would Christie's. To go to the point to point track, you would only definitely, you definitely get to the fourth last and you pull up. And um, he'd run maybe three weeks later and you'd pull him up at the second last, no matter what, you'd pull him up. Even if you thought you were going to win, you'd pull up at the second last. They'd run three weeks later. They'd win and you couldn't pull them up. And they wouldn't have known. They wouldn't have known they'd had a race. They've gone to the track, a bit like what Nicky Henderson said to me years ago, that the first day it was most important, the horses weren't killed, so they weren't afraid to jump into the lorry. Have a hard time going racing. It's different now. But that's, um, it's all about sales, isn't it? When Padge was there at, some, at one stage, I forget where the gallop was now, they would bring him down, maybe maybe eight or ten of them, and we let him they'd go. They'd probably work over two miles, and not that quick. And we let him quicken up the last three or four furlongs, and not that do that. Don't do much on him. But the ones went away in front, go to the bumpers, and the ones are ripping behind, go point point. And they wouldn't be costing fifteen, sixty thousand as zeros. I wouldn't like to buy a horse with fifty or sixty thousand now and try and go win a point to point with him. You know, it's doesn't make much sense. It doesn't make any difference who owns the horse or what they want or what the horse should do or what they want the horse to do. Nicky will do what the horse, what's right for the horse. If he needs time, he'll give some time. If is there an issue with him that has to be sorted, it's sorted. That's what, that's what sets him apart. He looks after the horse. And that's, that's my opinion. But it's, it's, he was always that way, in my opinion, as well as he would never be hard on a horse. And even going back when I was riding for years ago, I'm sure he hasn't changed. He'd always, always said that the, 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 the most important day in a horse's life is the first day he goes to the racetrack. And he doesn't need a bad experience. Because you don't forget bad experiences. Humans are animals. So he's, he's a good horseman. I don't think it should have changed that much. Um, I, haven't, I, haven't been to, I haven't been back there since Michonis, to be honest with you. I might go sometime. Um, it was a fair test of horses. And the fences were a bit bigger and you had this and that. And it, I thought it slowed horses down a bit. They weren't going as quick. The fences are a bit, I think, haven't been there, so I don't know. They look to be a bit smaller. They're, all the old jockey said the spots are smaller, but it looks that, and it looks like an ordinary handicap chase, to be honest with you. And they seem to be, they're taking horses out of it. 
The reason they have to take the horses out is because they modified the course because they're going faster. When the fences were big, I rode on 11 nationals and I think I fell in two and someone asked me, said it was a good record. It was a good record, I think. Not too bad, anyway. And I'd say the only reason, you'd have respect for a big fence then. And um, the first horse I rode in the national was, was um, Spartan Missile. And Nicky Henderson asked me, he said he had arranged for me to speak to Pat Taft. And um, would I give him a call? So I rang the famous man and I spoke to him. I said, um, I have no idea. I haven't seen the track. I've never been up there. I don't know what I'm going to do or what I should do. But Nicky said I should give you a call. I said, That's fine, he said. And he said, um, The fences are big, he said. Um, you need a good horse, something like that. And I just happened to say to him, Pat, um, do you give him a kick or do you see what do you do? Well, he said, John. If you start kicking around Liverpool, you've an awful lot of kicking to do. If it was me, I'd stay quiet, he said. And that's the way I kind of always, what I did. Because if the horse doesn't take to it, the man on top isn't going to help him that much. And if the, he can't give him a chance to work it out, he'll look after himself then. But if, I've seen a few horses fall, and it wasn't the horse's fault. You know, you can't gun horses. Back then, maybe you, can, you probably can now, but back then you couldn't gun the horse's defence. Because if you do, there's only one thing that's going to happen. You can't keep doing that all the time. The horse has to get into the rhythm and know what he's doing and get streetwise himself. That's, again, my opinion. But it kind of worked for me. And common sense isn't that common nowadays. You know, it's kind of out the window too, isn't it? Had a few, but nothing round the head, you know. Which is the main thing. When I was in England, I said that I wouldn't keep riding forever because it's a, t it's, it's a tough enough game, you know? And you'd like to get out in one piece maybe and do something else. So I thought, I'm not sure what the year was, but what the last ride I had was over there. Like, it's possible the last ride I had over there is when the H&S fell in the, the second national he ran in. So I decided oh, sometime that year I stopped. I kept my licence and I said, I'd start off by riding the first winner in Ireland and I'd ride the last winner in Ireland. So the last winner in Ireland I rode was at a, in a mayor's maiden hurdle in Clonmel, uh, a horse called Mary's Polly. She won three or four lengths. We backed her and I trained her. I don't have a trainer's license now, but I might get one again. <laughs>